Um, it's not often that Richard Todd and I have the opportunity to share a stage. As you'll see tonight, we each come with an independent voice. We thrive on this tremendous independence as much as the subtle subtext of interdependence. It's a very fragile balance. Um, we operate, though, as one office without individual studios. In truth, as an office overall, we're difficult to characterize or confine to a monolithic identity, approach, or doctrine. Um, as an office, we share and we're very committed to the public realm. The art of building, the power of architecture to catalyze and transform our environment, something very much important to us and to everybody here is the importance of sustainability in our work as well. We're fascinated by the layers and systems integral to realizing a great building, emerging technology's role in making that happen, the experiential aspects of the building, and the material quality, texture, and light. So what you'll see is um, the ideas and thoughts that each of us bring to this conversation that really defines who we are collectively. So the, the final three, I sort of see them as a group, um, are three projects that are currently um, two in construction and one in design, um, all city-funded projects, and talk about constraints. And um, I think, so I don't know how they've sort of collected themselves together as projects that I'm very involved in right now, but realizing that the aspirations for many of these projects are about efficiency, functionality, their dire need to build these buildings to give more students, you know, a great education to house the homeless. This is a project with Common Ground, the Sinatra High School for the Arts, and this, this is a Supreme Court building in Staten Island. And all of them really are budgetarily very tight, everything. So how do you look to the program? How do you look to the circumstances and make it more than the ordinary? Make it something that will become distinctive. And, and again, again, I think break the paradigm of the brick box with the double hung windows, which would function and work, but it really doesn't capture the imagination. So with the Sinatra High School, which is sort of weird, but it happens to be exactly on axis. This is the Lycee. And this is the Sinatra High School. And actually, my apartment is right here, which is totally its so strange. I realized that when I was standing on the roof of the building with Tony Bennett, and I looked across, and I was like, oh my gosh. It was all lined up. So uh, whatever that means, I don't know. But um, Tony Bennett started this school uh, in tribute to his best friend. And we were just really lucky to get the chance to do this. And he, it's in Astoria where he grew up, and a really kind of interesting site because it's the Museum of the Moving Images is here in Astoria Studios. So it's this collection of the arts in Astoria. And again, it's, a, it's 200 by 200. So how, from a tip of many of you here probably are doing school, so how do you extract act out of a typical program from the School Construction Authority the things that are important to make a school of the arts? So really trying to take that program and extract that to the avenue and inflect it toward that important intersection and then embedded within the center, the focal point of the Tony Bennett Concert Hall. So all of these sort of kits, a kit of parts and pieces that are the standard and how do you assemble them and create a hierarchy that creates that visual identity that is art, music and dance on the avenue, bringing a little bit of Broadway and activity and light to this part of Astoria within which a wonderful um, atrium space and then the theater itself. And here you can see a little larger is the actual transparency into the lobby space, into the theater. And I, I think the one thing that is helpful when you're doing this range of projects and how we benefit from all of it is that the projects where you can invent, other projects can learn from those. And here where the importance is the transparency and openness into um, the arts and revealing what's going inside rather than concealing it. So I think as glass becomes more ubiquitous and that we can use it, it is really something that makes a building give back to its streetscape. And here, which is a very dark neighborhood, has already started to transform with lots of activity and vitality. It should be done probably in about nine months to a year. And again, the interior volume of the atrium space and this sort of oval of the theater itself and the construction of it there. At, um, in Borum Hill, for Common Ground Community with the Actors Fund, we're doing 
a project um, that's for 217 residents. And this is a project that's a mid, mid block site. And it's kind of just like I'm feeling now. The subway goes right under it, but in this case, four subway lines. And um, <coughs> as you know, it's right on the edge of Borum Hill and downtown. And I think that to try to think about this sense of community and how can this network and efficiency of community, some of these are just wonderful examples of the tenement, the typical row house, this wonderful Esto photograph of the parking garage and the, the steamship but, and the beehive, but how has that become an organic whole? And so we looked really closely at the whole rhythm and ordering of this very efficient um, layout of single um, studio apartments and how that became the sort of backbone for the overall structure of the building. And here, the challenge and working with Nat Oppenheimer at Silman's office to figure out a structural system that in truth actually cantilevers the entire building over the subway and on four trusses. And in doing that, it um, gave us another great opportunity to create a green roof to the back, which is this whole social services community space with the housing above. And then it also enabled us to take that rhythm and order and make a really light wall because the lighter the wall was, the less weight it put actually on the trusses. So the use of creating these um, five towers that stand up to the downtown that will still really activate and create a dynamic neighborhood. And then there's a black box theater at the base and they're gonna have um, dance studios, they hope, um, right at the ground floor. So this, and this is a social services floor. And what, it was great going, these are, we learned a lot and when we used the channel glass at the Lycee because it had to all be cut on site. But here, we realized that we could get it prefabricated in the shop. So it's gonna be like Christmas because it's gonna go up in really a matter of a few weeks. And it's all starting to get crated to be shipped to the site. And then in the end, I think it's the dignity of the individual unit, the recognition that this is one unit. And ultimately, the connectivity, the alignment of doors across very small, modest things that start to allow a smaller a sense of community um, within the building. And then finally, um, I call this Working Girl Meets Olmstead um, because it's the Staten Island Courthouse. And it's, um, I don't know if many of you have spent a lot of time in St. George, but it's really a pretty terrific area with great views back to the city. But this is a site of four acres that is right in the heart of St. George that had a very sad history as a quarantine hospital. I was in Staten Island last night till 10.30 um, hearing about the, what to do about the remains on the site. But um, at this location, it's an amazingly visible piece on the skyline of Staten Island. And I think similarly, um, again, with great um, aspirations from some and not from others, how do you look to the program as a means to organize the whole order and reveal the machine of justice that's going on within the building that sits atop this site? So the towers of justice that really stack themselves in the whole, as I say, it's almost like being on the deck of the ferry looking back out to the waterfront and really seeing it as creating a new identity for justice um, for the 21st century. And just some study models here and then the site plan, and I think, I won't go into it, but this whole four acre site becomes an amazing network um, here, understanding the relationship and the set piece of all these civic buildings and how this surrounding the area of the burial grounds and the remains. And this um, just 3D shows that how the sort of building of the structure of the program starts to give a sense of the stacking and order of what's going on within and as it sits there. And I guess I end with this slide because I find it kind of interesting because the most public monumental space that everybody's dealing with in Staten Island is the ferry, and it actually has about that same scale, a little bit taller. Um, this is, as Calvin mentions, probably everybody's favorite television and radio uh, station and now internet. Um, and it's a very famous, you, probably most famous for Julia Child here, um, but this, their original building, when they were just a, a fledgling <laughs> radio station, now they are, as you all know, they do all these wonderful programs, they're in the internet, they're everywhere, uh, they're a, a national, they an international presence. Um, once upon a time, you know, this is the way technology was made, three different media that are, that are um, you know, really quite separate from each other, but no more, as we all know, 
now there's so much more convergence of con not only the content with its technology, but uh, the digital world allows you to use so many different platforms in, in so many different ways. And it was time for WGBH to get with that program and change. Um, this is their current site. It's on Western Avenue behind the Harvard Business School. Uh, Harvard gave them a, a go away plan um, and to, because they want to expand. And they moved about a couple of miles over here to this is Market Street and the Mass Pike, a very visible site. However, encumbered by, they purchased a virtually new utterly indistinguished spec office building, and they purchased another lot across the street from it. Um, and that was the site of the new project. We noticed that uh, this is a place on the pike when it's actually you come around this bend, and that's when you see downtown Boston, and you say, oh, we're in Boston. Um, so it's a kind of gateway for the whole experience of entering from the west. And you can see this site for about two miles down the Pike, which is something that we were most interested in. This is a strange diagram where we tried to figure out, in fact, although they're not really on the air very much, there are thousands of people in the morning that are looking at this site uh, and probably stuck in rush hour traffic too. That seemed like a real opportunity to us. Right now, they have 12, built, they had 12 buildings uh, scattered around across the street and it was really a rather dysfunctional scenario. They've boiled that down to two sites, but as I mentioned, interrupted by a, a street. In Boston, there are two things that are against the rules. One is building over a street, and, and the other is uh, digital media on electronic science, and we did both of them, as you'll see. Uh. Um, this is the showing, just to kind of change in scale, it's really quite radical from highway scale and office buildings. This is New Balance's corporate headquarters. This is our fabulously beautiful building that we were, we were given to, to deal with. And then the scale at the other end of the site is something like that. Um, this was their current, their condition. You know, we, we use this to convince the people at the Boston Redevelopment Authority because they literally were rolling equipment across the street, um, which is kind of primitive. Uh, here's that building, but again, and we are faced with this condition of going across the street. And the solution became to not only build a, a little bridge, but really make the whole building go over the street. Uh, and to use a kind of horizontal counterbalance to the verticality of that new balance building. The program is as follows. There's a lot of office space that we placed in the existing building, but mostly back of house program. Um, there are a whole series of television and radio studios. They need to be at grade for uh, many reasons. Uh, and they, so they are on the, the new site. And then we put a new connecting piece, we call the, the connector there, that contains all of the people who make content, um, who make those television shows. And the idea is and then they, they, are, they are the glue of this organization, and then they can move in, into the two other pieces and, and vice versa. So here you can see how that stacks up. And at the same time, is stepping down from the highway scale to the, to the more residential scale on the side. That beam originally was uh, much more aerated, perforated with, with space, as shown in the grid thing here. And you can see underneath it then we were trying kind of spinning around the various studios and really colliding with this building. I think, right? We all felt it was not, this was not a hands-off condition that we could do, we could have some fun with this building. And so um, we really literally intersected it in a much more perhaps aggressive way than, than people might be used to in Boston. Um, on the, uh, this is some of the early studies of the elevations, but and it, uh, you can see here there was always the idea there was going to be some kind of signage. This was actually a rooftop movie theater that, that got cut from the budget too bad. Um, and, and, but then the sign became down onto the building, and then it really kind of got integrated into the skin of the building itself. And that started to make a whole lot of sense. We realized there was this sweet spot. Here you are looking down the, the highway right at the end of the building. Um, now you can see here, this, this may run or may not, there we go. Um, this was a cause of great concern at the Boston Redevelopment Authority. Um, they don't want advertising here, they don't want some in your face thing that's going to cause people to drive off the road, but WDBH wasn't really interested in that. They're much more interested in something kind of mind bending and maybe a little weird kind of thing that might make you think every morning, what am I going to see? this morning. Every day it's just something different. Um, and so here, for example, imagine it's, 
It's a dark, rainy day, and they're running big, fluffy clouds in a blue sky. Um, that's the kind of stuff they do, uh, and it's, kind of, it's really it's a lot of fun. And it's not about advertising or being a real busy, you know, uh, frenetic device. We worked with two by four graphic designers to create this kind of logarithmic scale uh, to get as much LED as we could for you know as little money as possible. And as you see, it gets denser as it goes towards the end of the site. Um, and now here you can actually see, here it is, and this is a, see if it comes back on there. But there it is actually working, running, and the, the little strips do a great job of kind of spreading that image across the, across the face of the building. And nobody's had an accident yet. Uh, so in plan, you can see there are many public spaces. They actually invite the public into this building. There's a big auditorium. Uh, these are television and radio studios. Down here are two big studios in the back, and that's the other building. And then here you can see an elevation how the office spaces fly over those other spaces using the old core of that building and a new core at either, at either end. Um, the thing is 50 feet in the air, there are two floors of space that are, that are flying over the street. So it's actually not so, it's not really oppressive at all being under, underneath it. Uh, and as I said, every day they have some interesting, like this was the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of Sputnik. Um, so you know, every day there's something cool to look at uh, on this thing that they, that they think up. Uh, here you can see now the, the collage that I was talking about earlier, how this beam is, is intersected with that building and really transforms it um, and, is, and is sitting off the grid of the street but then um, playing with all these other pieces that the television and radio studio is stretching out to the side there. Um, from the street, it's a different experience. Uh, the thing is elevated way up in the air and there there's a lot more. You can actually walk up and look into the studios and see what's going on here. Uh, and it changes from, you know, as the light uh, goes past the glass, it can become very opaque or very transparent. In, and these are simply some views of inside in the lobby, some of their public spaces, all made with industrial materials. There is no stone in this building. Um, it's all corrugated metal. And this is as fancy as it gets. It's Tarata, because this is WGBH. This is, this is not, you know, Dow Jones or something like that. It's a, um, it's a very different thing. Um, that's their big screening room. You can see there, and this is one of their big FM recording studios. This is the tech stuff here, you know, a television studio, a radio, and then that's the master control, or it's the brain of the whole, of the whole operation. Um, and there, there you see that beam with a, uh, all of those creative people up in there that are moving. The last project I wanted to show is a uh, Museum of Natural History for uh, the state of Utah, which is in Salt Lake City, that, um, that we're developing um, right now. This is a, a plan of Salt Lake City um, just um, at the edge of the Wasatch Range, which turns into the, into the mountains. Uh, the Donner Party, actually, those poor people were destined to come through that ravine into the valley. And the site for the building is right at the edge of what was the shorefront of Lake Bonneville, which is, was a body of water that actually filled Salt Lake, um, the Salt Lake Basin. <coughs> in, some, in some distant past, there was some catastrophe, and that lake drained on out into the Pacific Ocean. Um, and so what was left were these, was this bench where the old um, shore used to be, and the site six, sits actually right on one of those benches, so when you look to the east, you have the mountain ranges, and then out to the south, you have um, Salt Lake. Uh, early on in the process, we did some, a whole series of uh, explorations to try to understand the building in the landscape. This was actually before we kind of uh, became informed. We spent about a week traveling the whole state, a little more than a week traveling the whole state in a couple of uh, the governor's jeeps. Um, and basically what we discovered is that, you know, Utah is about the land. It's about how people have tried to engage the land um, for all time, Native Americans um, till the present day. It's uh, stunningly beautiful, has tr sort of transformative scale, very, very powerful um, uh, landforms. Um, and so 
we sort of started to think about the land and how we react to it, given the fact that what we had to do was build a museum of natural history. Um, this, this kind of landscape, um, the way we as human beings relate to these landscapes usually is in a fairly emotional way. You know, we, we walk on it, we hike it, we ski it. When we're out there, we kind of smell it. Um, we kind of gauge its scale by our size. Um, but in the end, the way we um, have to look at it when we are studying it, when we are um, trying to catalog it and deliver it um, in, um, in a more broken down way to, um, um, for, for its study and for, for educating others, is we have a tendency to take it apart into a most, its most essential elements. So we took, a land, we took the landscape and we thought, well, okay, what we can do with that landscape is we can use what um, we all use actually all the time in architecture, these um, triangulated um, integrated networks, which basically represent that contour as a series of three points in space and then the plane that um, connects them. And it can be done at any scale. It can be grotesque, grotesquely large or infinitely small or at a molecular level. Um, and so what we did is we kind of reduced this thing to a database, this kind of map. And then on top of it, we then add other information which we try to illuminate in a kind of singular way, which in this case, let's just say, is, is kind of topography or geography. Um, you can um, do the sort of vegetation. You can understand wind currents over that, those elevations. Um, you can understand, actually, you can begin to map weather with it um, in terms of its uh, the sort of baseline approach. So um, we were told early on that we were to not disturb this or disturb the site as little as possible. The building um, is probably going to end up with a gold rating. They're very sensitive to the landscape there. This is actually our site right here. Um, <laughs> it actually they don't want us to disturb the site, but actually this was the target of a firing range. They shot shells into it, so it's also a little contaminated. But we're not going to disturb it. Um, but what we thought we would do is um, we would use this idea of mapping the land. Um, and where we did disturb it and put back the landscape, we would go ahead and make it man-made. We would go ahead and use this idea of the, the sort of triangulated integrated solid um, or the uh, networks um, and, and leave it that way. So where man touched it, it is no longer organic. It is no longer natural, even though it was blown up a bit, um, and that the building itself would be a kind of, um, kind of man-made eruption out of that uh, man-made landscape. Um, and then we um, have a kind of material roof um, up at the top. And so this is what it's become. It still continues to evolve a little bit, but um, basically it's a series of bars laid along the contours. There's exhibit space off to the south. Um, the collections are cradled at the center, some temporary exhibit and the administration up here. There's a Native American um, exhibit um, in the back. The entrance is um, actually from a drop off and down at a lower level. We've buried the service to try to uh, reduce the impact of, of that. And then in the center is a, what we call the canyon space, which is the, the kind of big uh, free zone. These are some earlier uh, computer sketches. Here you can begin to see the articulation of the landscape um, in, the, in the kind of triangular form. Base of concrete, um, which is grown out of the earth. Um, this is a copper roof right across the, actually if you look out of this window, you can actually see into the, one of the largest copper mines in the world, the Kennecott Copper Mine. Um, and we're trying to work with them to uh, provide some of this uh, kind of copper uh, skin. A view off um, from the south, there's a running trail, which is also a pipeline, which runs right along that bench, which um, is a kind of uh, runner and biker's highway. And then sitting on a, up on the hill, looking for profiles and the kind of fragments that begin to complement the edge of, of the kind of Wasatch uh, landscape. Studying a little closer some of the copper patterns, um, the big glass window at the uh, entrance to the canyon. Um, we've spent some time looking at the different patterns and whoops, different patterns and weathering conditions of different alloys so that we could create this kind of striation, this fine striation in the copper 
Um, and then there's this funny intermediate material, which we don't know what it is yet. Um, this is the beginnings of the canyon space, which is a very, very tall space. These slot canyons are some of the most uh, fantastic um, spaces um, and the condition of light. Um, and so what we're trying to do is they're kind of places of inspiration. And in looking at these, this large space, we were looking for a way to create a, a, a space that would inspire visitors to learn about Utah and about the region. Um, sequence is very important. Um, this is leading up from the main entrance. As you turn, you begin to actually see all of the, um, the landscape beyond. Um, there, are other, there are other aspects of the building, but the whole idea was to begin to fragment Fragment the walls a little bit so that the space itself um, became the kind of the void of learning. Bridges connect from collection areas into exhibit areas. We're working with Ralph Applebaum um, now on, uh, on some of those things. Ralph has been working on this project for many, many years, and it's just beginning to um, solidify. So this is the main view up to the back of, of our can canyon space. Um, off to the right through these crevices um, are the galleries which actually step down the hill behind these panels. There's a port in place concrete stair and elevator core which take you up. This is all a free zone. You're allowed to get inside and walk around. You don't have to pay until you get all the way to the backside. And then there's a, what we call the collections wall which is the kind of rationalized version of, um, of, of displaying some of these artifacts as opposed to an interpretive way which is on the other side of the... Anyway, um, so that is the Museum of Natural History in Utah. And um, it isn't as simple um, as we'd like it, but it's going to have to get a little simpler because it's a little bit over the budget, just a little bit over the budget. Um, but hopefully um, we'll be headed into working drawings uh, with that. And I think that is it. Um, I thank you all for coming. Um, Susie and Richard and I have spent many, many years together. Um, and as we've been saying, we've never probably enjoyed each other as much as when we put this whole thing together. And, um, and we would love to answer any questions you have, if you have any. Thank you.